established English club slash Sigma Tau Delta English department lecture series. And so I'll hand it over to Dr. Kirkhoff. We'll get started. Hi, everyone. How are you doing tonight? It's very chilly, so I'm very excited that you decided to brave the elements to listen to me talk about comics for a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm flattered that you, you showed up. Uh, uh, the way I'm going to sort of proceed tonight uh, is you're going to get to listen to me talk uh, for about 30 to 35 minutes. I have a, a, a short blurb I'm going to read, essentially about a 30 to 35 minute blurb, and then I'm going to show you uh, some pretty cool things that comics are up to now. Uh, and that, uh, I hope, will be a little bit more interactive. And certainly, uh, when I'm done talking, feel free to uh, fire questions my direction and, and, and share your thoughts. Um, can people see the screen OK? Great. So we start uh, with Scott McCloud uh, and, re and Reinventing Comics, published in 2001. Uh, this is the second of Scott McCloud's provocative trilogy that explicates the complexity of graphic narrative in comic book format. Uh, McLeod discusses the infiltration of comics into the digital world in this particular text. He argues that theoretically, the shift from print to digital will radically change the shape of creating, producing, and consuming comics. Specifically, he posits that, quote, the page is an artifact of print, no more intrinsic to comics than Staples or India Inc. Once released from that box, some will take the shape of the box with them, but gradually, comics creators will stretch their limbs and start to explore the design opportunities of an infinite canvas, end quote. McLeod's notion of infinite canvas encourages comic creators, particularly digital comic creators, to challenge the traditional structure of a comic book. Thus, he advocates digital comics to dabble in creating things like a 500-panel story told vertically or horizontally like a great graphic skyline. Put quite simply, in a digital environment, uh, comics can take virtually any size and shape as the temporal map, comics conceptual DNA, uh, as it grows in its new dish." End quote. Though McLeod admitted that most online comics are no more than repurposed print at heart, he writes about infinite canvas, uh, canvas comics with a hopeful verve, uh, believing that digital comic creators would soon be productively challenging the boundaries of what it means to be a comic. Tonight, I am going to explore the future of the graphic narrative in the new media age, uh, paying particular attention, of course, to the evolution of digital comics. Uh, I'm going to challenge digital comics to become a more interactive, immersive medium that actively strives to redefine the reader-text relationship. I'll be extending Scott McCloud's notion of an infinite canvas, uh, and to do so, I will draw from Espen Arseth's definition of ergodic literature and Gerard Gannett's theory of hypertextuality to show how digital comics can, and with recent developments within the last year, uh, are uh, extending, expanding, and amplifying their print-based counterparts. Uh, I'll be encouraging an intentional, complex reader text interaction. Uh, but first, uh, to make this argument, I'm going to demonstrate how the majority of digital comics, uh, certainly digital comics prior to what's been developed uh, in the past year, are attempting to remediate their paper-based counterparts. Uh, and as such, recreate the tech reader text interaction found in those so-called floppy uh, paper comics. Secondly, then, using the tenets of ergodic literature and hypertextuality, I will offer possibilities for digital comics to break free from their attempts to replicate print comics. And then, as I said tonight, uh, I'll conclude by showing some really cool things that are happening in comics. Uh, so in order to make this argument, it is first uh, important to establish the so-called parts uh, that typically make up a print-based comic. Uh, this is a necessary exercise in order to demonstrate how many digital comics seek to replicate print-based comics. Uh, so we start with the panel, uh, which is oftentimes also known as uh, the frame, depending on which theorist you're talking to. Will Eisner describes the function of the panel adroitly. He writes, to deal with the capture or encapsulation of the events in the flow of the narrative, they must be broken up into sequence segments. These segments are called panels or frames. Benoit Peters argues that panels can be laid out in four distinct ways. Conventionally, where panels are consistently and constantly laid out the same way. Decoratively, where the aesthetic is privileged over the narrative. Rhetorically, where the dimensions of the panel bow to the action that is described. And productively, where the organization of the page dictates the flow of the story. While Peter's categorizations are certainly not the only analytical approach to studying panels, they do nonetheless demonstrate that how panels are arranged on the page dictates the nature of the narrative 
and encourages a certain kind of narrative interpretation. The size, placement, and content of panels are all key aspects of the comic narrative, especially as my international graphic novel students will tell you. Uh, and that leads us then uh, to the page. The page is a shockingly oft overlooked aspect of print-based comics. Uh, on the one hand, uh, the page is simply the area where panels are arranged to create the visual narrative. However, pages are sometimes used to further a story or narrative. The most obvious example is a splash page, like this one uh, that I've placed up on the screen. Eisner notes that the splash page typically serves as a visual introduction to a particular narrative or story. That is, it gives the reader a clue as to what uh, the story they are about to read will be about. Another way the page can add to the narrative is through the actual color of the page. Uh, consider, most comic book pages, like this one, uh, has a stock white background to it. Um, while the panels on the page are sometimes full of vibrant colors, though of course uh, it could be uh, black or sepia ink. Uh, however, though, uh, sometimes uh, pages are given a different color, red to indicate violence, blue to indicate mourning, black to indicate death, and so forth. Uh, so the color of, of the page will obviously signal a, a certain shift in mood and, and sort of cue the reader again uh, that, that there's a, a certain mood to be evoked. Uh, lastly, it's important to point out uh, that the page really serves as a restrictive device. This is really key to my argument tonight. Uh, as Eisner points out, only so many panels can fit on one page. The comic creator must decide how many panels to place on a page, and that's a decision that's going to affect the timing and the pacing of a comic narrative. There is no infinite canvas with print comics, as the page serves as a binding, restrictive, organizational grid. Though it should be noted that uh, the screen can also be a very restrictive device uh, as well, and we'll certainly look at how digital comics are working around uh, that restriction here in a little bit. Uh, that brings us to the gutter, uh, which is quite simply just the space that you see between panels. Uh, as McLeod writes, nothing is seen between the two panels, but experience tells you that something must be there. Uh, Scott Buchanan clarifies McLeod's definition of the gutter by suggesting the gutter demands that the reader must simultaneously gra the, grasp the continuities and discontinuities that connect panel A and panel B. McLeod argues that the gutter is one of the most important aspects of comics, uh, and this is an understandable and logical argument, given that the gutter uh, helps establish sort of the spatio-temporal movement of a particular sequence. That is, the reader's mentally constructing what happens between panels, and similarly, how long the events from panel to panel take. Uh, while the artist can certainly give the reader visual cue, cues, uh, the gutter is the space that forces uh, the reader to make sort of a seamless narrative from image to image. Uh, icons, probably the most uh, straightforward of the parts of a comic narrative. Uh, simply put, they're the images used to represent the people, places, things, or idea in a, in a comic page or a comic panel. Uh, and lastly, uh, or at least the last one I'm going to be talking about tonight, uh, right now at least, captions and word balloons. Uh, comic books are certainly a medium that tends to privilege the visual, uh, but many comics make extensive use of alphabetic text as well, often the form of captions or word balloons. Uh, comic book captions tend to mirror silent film intertitles in their purpose. Uh, so that is, they're used to identify characters or places, uh, work as temporal markers, provide a narrative summary, offer further character descriptions, paraphrase dialogue, or provide ongoing commentary. Uh, word balloons try to capture the dialogue and thoughts of characters within a particular narrative. Uh, this is often done through the typography seen in the balloons. Uh, a certain font might depict one character, bold might indicate yelling, uh, italics whispering, uh, and so forth. The word balloon is completely dependent on icons and panels, as very rarely, if ever, are you going to see a panel co only consisting of a word balloon. Usually a word balloon is anchored very much so to a character, which is a really unique aspect. So now that I've had the opportunity to sort of share the typical parts uh, of a print-based comic, uh, we can sort of start looking uh, at, at my argument uh, in terms of where digital comics are uh, and where digital comics should be going. Uh, and to do this, remediation uh, is a really useful theoretical framework uh, to analyze any new media text, uh, and in particular tonight, digital comics. Uh, it's devised by J. David Bolter and Richard Grusin, uh, and they argue that remediation uh, is simply when new media presents itself as refashioned and improved version of other or older media. Simply put, the representation of one medium in another is remediation. 
What makes new media new, according to Bolter and Grusin, is that it refashions itself to become acceptable and understood for whatever social or economic climate our society is in. In short, rather than look at newer technologies, such as the internet, uh, as something that establishes its own aesthetic or cultural values, Bolter and Grusin suggest that these new mediums achieve their values by refashioning prior media. Thus, remediation offers the opportunity for scholars to compare and examine the ways mediated forms are appropriated and or absorbed into different mediums or texts. For Bolter and Grusin, remediation manifests itself in two ways, immediacy and hypermediacy. Immediacy is a style of visual representation whose goal it is to make the viewer forget the medium. So you're trying to forget what kind of medium you're viewing. You're trying to be immersed in the work itself. Uh, examples of immediate uh, new media texts might include computer games such as Myst, Riven, and Doom. Uh, these are games that actively work to immerse the player in the video game world. Uh, conversely, hypermediacy is a style of visual representation uh, whose goal is to remind the viewer of the medium. Uh, the authors offer photo montages as an example of a hypermediated new media text. They note that when pho photo monteurs cut up and recombine conventional photographs, they discredit the notion that the photograph is drawn by the pencil uh, or nature. Instead, the photographers themselves uh, become elements that human intervention has selected and arranged for artistic purposes. Uh, whether or not digital comics actually remediate print-based print -based comics is up for debate. Uh, most digital comics, as McLeod notes in Reinventing Comics, are recreations of their print-based counterparts. Uh, this can be seen in a wide range of comics being released. Uh, for instance, Marvel, DC, Image, IDW, probably comic book companies you're all familiar with, uh, all offer digital catalogs of their print-based releases. You can get these through their websites, uh, through websites like Comixology, uh, etc. Instead of going to a local comic shop, uh, a user can download the same content for their computer or mobile device. Uh, while this may be a remediation in the sense that the mode of the narrative has changed, print to digital, uh, it is not necessarily representative of remediation as conceived by Bolter and Grusin. For one thing, it would be very difficult to argue that digital comics are an improved version of print com uh, uh, digital comics improved version of print, uh, of print comics. While there may be some advantages, digital comics only require hard drive space, for instance, so you don't have bulky comic book boxes taking up your entire room like I have. Uh, the narrative presented is the exact same narrative uh, in the print comic. In fact, some might argue that digital comics seeking to recreate print comics are inferior. Uh, Dave Scheidt, a comic book fan who writes for the Huffington Post, notes that for true comic fans, digital comics aren't going to replace printed traditional ones anytime soon. There's an elegance to holding a book in your hands. Holding a Kindle or an iPad is not the same feeling. As J. Richard Stevens and Christopher Edward Bell, scholars who conducted a study on why comic book fans prefer different modes of dissemination, fans opposed to digital comics argue that the activity of reading digital comics cheapens the value of their property. Uh, so fans, a lot of fans are placing inherent value in, in their print comics, which is really interesting. Uh, there's definitely more to consider, though, regarding the remediation from print to digital. Consider, the parts of a comic book exist primarily, as I said, to the, due to the restrictions of a print-based comic book. The number of panels, for instance, is limited due to the page size of a printed comic. Word balloons and captions exist because individuals cannot speak. Written onomatopoeia sounds, such as boom, whiz, zap, bang, whatever, uh, exist to enhance the action because print comics do not have sound bites, uh, and so forth. So that is, uh, print comics... Uh, and the fascinating complexity of image and word exist only because of medium and modal constraints. Digital comics do not face this dis uh, constraint, for as Jacob Dittmer writes, digital comics, quote, are no longer bound to a uniform page format, end quote. This is, of course, the general idea of McLeod's infinite canvas discussed at the very beginning of this presentation. Yet most digital comics, particularly those released by large comic book publishers, such as Marvel, DC, and so forth, continue to reproduce print-based comics verbatim. To use the vocabulary of Bolter and Grusin, the attempted remediation of print comics is one that embodies the concept of immediacy. That is, by offering the same content and form as print comics, digital comics are perhaps attempting to make all readers forget they are reading their favorite graphic narrative on a Kindle instead of in a flop. While this may be a laudable goal, from a materiality standpoint, it becomes an impossible goal. Certainly, digital comics have proven that they can easily recreate the definable elements of a print-based comic, the page, the panels, gutters, word balloons, and so forth. 
Uh, they're identical in digital and print-based comics. That is, but as is often the case in reproductions and remediations, something else is lost. The transformation from print to digital causes the reader to lose an inherent aspect of the reading experience. Uh, consider the material affordances of print comics, paper, ink, staples, advertisements if it's an original floppy comic, uh, the smell of a comic. If you ever smell some old golden age issues, there's this musty smell that just sort of overpowers you for good or bad. Uh, despite the fine attempts of Comixology and other digital comic platforms to painstakingly recreate the essence of the print-based comic, it's impossible to duplicate the feeling a reader gets by physically turning the page. It's impossible to replace the smudges readers get on their fingers when reading an older comic. It's impossible to capture the glossy page's crispness in newer comics. So while readers may get their story in the necessary parts of a comic, the transformation of print to digital necessarily causes a different kind of reader text interaction. Flipping the pages of a print-based comic is replaced by a point-and-click mentality, or is increasingly the case, a finger swipe uh, mentality made popular by mobile devices. So, of course, I'm aware I sound like an old fogey, a light-eyed, waxing nostalgic for the days of smelly comics uh, found in a good old comic book shop, but that 